So this session is uh, pulsed power as a tool to access high energy density physics. Um, and uh, let me introduce the first speaker, uh, probably the name, the name known to all of you in this room for this particular meeting, um, Dr. Nick Hawker. Um, Nick um, studied fusion at Oxford University for his master's thesis and his DPhil. Um, and he collaborated uh, with uh, Yanis Ventikos at that time. And his simulation showed that shock-driven cavity collapse um, leads to inertial confinement. And uh, his interest in the possibility of leading that to fusion led to them to, uh, the two of them, Nick and Yanis, to set up uh, First Light Fusion in 2011. Um, Nick joined that company as CEO and Chief Technology Officer in 2012. And he continues to oversee the technical vision for the company. So. Um, Nick is going to talk with, to us about First Light's new pulse power machine and opportunities for collaboration. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And, um, well, thank you to, to everyone for being here. Um, it really is humbling to be um, in this company and in this, in this place in the Royal Society. So um, I, I hope it's going to be a very interesting day and event. Um, so I'm here to tell you about our new proposed uh, facility and also talk about opportunities for uh, collaboration. Um, so why, why are we interested in doing this? Some motivation for this, for this event. Um, I mean, there's a simple piece here, which is this is the first time in a really sort of public forum we're talking about an actual concrete machine design for our game demonstrator. So it's to try and put that across, you know, for discussion and, and, uh, and debate. Um, but then also, um, there are some other motivators. Um, we think collaboration is absolutely essential. Fusion is too difficult a problem to solve by ourselves. Um, we think we have to work with as many people as we can possibly find. Uh, to solve these incredibly difficult um, challenges. Um, we also need uh, a lot of people and a lot of talent. And um, we, we, I sort of turn it around and say we don't want to be just customers. So my customers, in, in the sense, what I mean is uh, part of the purpose of academia is to produce you know, highly trained, highly motivated uh, young scientists and engineers. So we are, of, of course, a customer of those, of those um, people, but we want to be contributors to uh, that environment as well. Um, and help bring people into the field, field of fusion and the field of high energy density physics as well. Um, and I think I speak for the whole First Light team and just saying that with our scientists hat on, uh, we think this is just an amazing opportunity for fundamental science, this machine that we're building. And we would all be very sad if that opportunity wasn't realized. So we really want to do everything we can uh, to realize the, the full potential of this, um, this machine. Um, the output from today's meeting is then input for us. Uh, so that is what we're, what, what we're after here, is how can this machine work for you? What would you need it to look like? What diagnostics would you need? What structures and processes and so on around the whole machine would you need to actually use this productively for fundamental science? So we're, we're here to kind of listen as much as we can uh, to kind of take that, take that input. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, today a little bit about our core, um, uh, core kind of physics and the, the, the approach we take to fusion. Uh, I'm going to skip through that quite quickly because the, the bulk of the presentation is about the new machine which we, which we plan to build. Then I'm going to talk about opportunities for collaboration. Um, Paul has teed up wonderfully uh, talking about the engineering challenges of building a power plant, which I'm not really going to focus on. So we, we see this as, as, two, as two phases. Uh, we have um, the gain demonstrator and then after that the build of a, a pilot plant. We're going to try and overlap them to shorten the time scales, but uh, today we're focused on the design of the game uh, demonstrator. Okay, so um, First Light's approach to fusion. Um, probably many of you have seen this description before, but um, we are using a high-velocity projectile um, as, a, as a new driver for inertial fusion. Um, so the way we launch that projectile is electromagnetically. So we have a big pulsed power machine, a big capacitor bank, which discharges very quickly, uh, makes extreme magnetic fields, and um, launches a projectile with um, J cross B force, Lorentz force. Uh, so it's kind of like a rail gun, basically. And the projectile is the, is the uh, I kind of like to describe inertial fusion as um, an internal combustion engine, or like an internal combustion engine, it's a pulsed process. And the, the projectile is like the spark plug. Uh, 
uh, sort of the driver is, 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 like, is the thing which puts the energy in, triggers the fuel to burn, and then you get that energy release. Uh, the projectile hits into the target. And the key technology for us is the target design. So the projectile driver is a, is a cheap, low-cost way to get a lot of energy, but it delivers that energy quite slowly, so it's low power. The target design compensates for that. Um, and it compensates in two, two ways. Um, so first, um, uh, oh, sorry, I haven't actually described it. So <laughs> something called the amplifier within the target. So we kind of think of the target always in these two parts. There's the fuel capsule, which is actually the final piece containing the fuel. And then there's um, something which we call an amplifier, which um, I'm not going to go into the design of that today, unfortunately. This is our kind of key technology in the secret source. Um, but if you kind of imagine, to imagine it, it's kind of an object this sort of size, 20, 30 millimeter kind of cube. Um, and it's just made of normal stuff, normal materials. Um, and the amplifier design challenge is basically an, um, um, a geometry optimization for what we put where inside uh, that that cube. So the amplifier does two things. Firstly, it boosts the effective velocity. So the projectile hits at one velocity, the fuel, the fuel capsule collapses at a much higher velocity. So this is existing performance on, uh, our, um, on the BFG. Um, so six and a half kilometer per second impact gives a release velocity of 80 kilometers per second. So it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big amplification. And then the second thing that the amplifier does is it creates convergence. So convergence is extremely important for inertial fusion. It's a very effective way to get a high concentration of energy, very high density uh, state of matter. Um, our process from the outside has no convergence. The projectile hits from one side. The, the uh, convergence is created completely within the amplifier. Um, so this is extremely important for the kind of risk profile we're talking about in terms of the core physics. I'm going to come back to that in a, uh, in a second. So what is the objective of uh, the gain demonstrator? Just to sort of talk about that. Um, the objective, I mean, we put it in quantitative terms because we felt it's helpful to have a quantitative measure. Um, so we're aiming for a fuel gain of 100 or more, using the NIF, the NIF definition of, of fuel gain. Um, but the, the principle is more important than the measurement, than the number. Uh, the principle is to de-risk the physics of self-heating. So the, the positive feedback process that happens when fusion starts and the alpha particles deposit their energy in the fuel and that heats the fuel up and then it fuses more and then you get more alpha particles. That positive feedback process is what we're aiming to, uh, to de-risk. Um, we think that's the, uh, the, the kind of the biggest physics transition between now and um, designing these things for a power plant. If you can correctly model that self-heating process, this is our, our you know, thesis, um, then we would have the tools that we need uh, to design um, high-gain targets that you, for, a, for a power plant and to do that primarily in silico. Um, setting this objective is a bit different to many of the other fusion companies where they're talking about target gain or Q, um, and Q greater than one. Um, um, we decided uh, on this approach um, because we wanted to be completely focused on the physics of the the burning plasma and not on the efficiency of the machine and any of the surroundings. We wanted to make it completely about the physics problem. And um, this was something which was done very much in collaboration with our scientific advisory board. And I kind of, sort of characterized this as it's probably the strongest piece of advice we've ever got from them is you no, know, to talk about ignition as the important thing, uh, not target gain as a, as a semi arbitrary kind of line in the sand, not tied to the physics. Uh, so, yeah, our strategy is to maximally separate the physics and engineering challenges. And um, just a last point, because we are calling this a gain demonstrator. And so in the media and you know, in public stuff, you're going to see us calling it a gain demonstrator. This is a, just a deliberate sort of compromise choice. Rather than calling it an ignition demonstrator, which is what it kind of really is, we're calling it a gain demonstrator because it's more easily understood by lay people. And we're not trying to play any games with, with, with you know, what we're achieving here. The principle is, is self-heating. That's what we're looking for. And then... Um, a final piece on the kind of core physics. Um, so um, the amplifier designs which we prefer for the gain demonstrator, they produce proper spherical implosions or pseudo-spherical implosions. So there's planar impact from, from one side, and then the core process which is taking place is a spherical implosion in the middle of the, uh, of the target. Uh, we like that approach because it allows us to reuse exactly designs from literature. So the one that we are using as the basis for the gain demonstrator is something called the revolver design. 
uh, which is a triple shell design uh, with a, a, a gold shell, a copper shell, and beryllium shell. We're not interested in any of that outside stuff. That's for coupling to a laser. What we're doing is taking just the final gold shell, extracting that design point out, and then our amplifier is a new wrapper around that system. Um, sphericity, how spherical we can be, is a very key parameter. I'm just going to say that and then leave, leave that there for now. Okay, so um, the machine design. Um, firstly, uh, uh, this is the fourth iteration, fourth major iteration. The team have been pushing extremely hard over the last few weeks to kind of bring this together for today. Uh, this is not the final design. The design is not fixed. Uh, this is a genuine opportunity to contribute and to influence the design of the machine. Okay, uh, shiny pictures. <laughs> so this is what it uh, could look like. Um, so this is modeled after the Zeb machine at Sandia, and that's very deliberate because the Zeb machine works and has been around for a long time. It's the largest pulse power machine in the world. We want to keep the core pulse power as close to the Zeb machine as, uh, as possible. Um, the machine has three layers in it, so I'm going to go through and explain a bit about the, um, the kind of topology and architecture, but um, if you sort of look in this section of the machine, there's three sets of triplate uh, transmission lines. Um, there's 42 modules per layer, so 126 modules overall. Uh, the total stored energy is 100 megajoules. It says in your program that um, the diameter is 100 meters but iteration for this design is 75 meters across. Um, and that's actually because we've, in the design optimization, removed some pulse power elements that the Z machine has that we don't think that we need at the moment. Um, and um, there's an oil-filled section, so all of this part of the machine is uh, insulated with oil, and then there's a water-filled section, which is the central part, and then there's a vacuum chamber in the middle. Again, that's similar to um, uh, Sandia Z machine. Um, Okay, so let's, let's, let's go through it. Um, so the, the first part of the machine is what's called uh, the Marks Bank. And this is um, basically an arrangement which allows you to charge um, capacitors in parallel to a charge voltage, but then discharge them in serial and add the voltages together. So the charge voltage is going to be something like 90 kilovolts, but the discharge voltage of the Marks Bank as a whole will be uh, 7 megavolts. The stored energy per Marks Bank is 2.4 uh, megajoules. Uh, that's a bit bigger than the Z machine. So the Z machine is about one megajoule per uh, Marx bank. It's also slightly higher voltage, I think. I think Z, the charge voltage on Z is six. Looking at Paul. Um, yeah, something like that. So it's pretty, it's pretty similar in terms of voltage. Um, next thing in the machine is uh, what's called the intermediate storage capacitor or the intermediate store or the I store. Um, this is basically a big steel cylinder with a central conductor and an outer shell, and it's, it's surrounded by oil, but it's filled with water inside. Uh, so it, it acts like a, a, a massive capacitor, basically. Um, this, this design point, the capacitance of the intermediate store is uh, about a third higher than the capacitance of the Marx bank. Uh, that's notable because typically these designs for these machines, actually the intermediate store has a lower capacitance, and that's because you get a a ringing effect, so you can have a higher voltage on the intermediate store if it has a lower capacitance. That's normally seen as a good thing in pulse power uh, machine design. This optimization found the other scenario, so the voltage on the intermediate store is lower than the Marx bank, so it's 5 megavolts peak voltage. The reason the optimization was pushed this way is because of the next component in the system, which is the switch, which I'll talk about in a second. So the Marx bank discharges into the intermediate store, and the effective pulse duration of that is 1.2 microseconds. And um, three intermediate stores, a column, they are all three going to be charged by one Marx bank. Uh, um, yep. Okay, the next element in the system then is a laser-triggered gas switch. So this is a component about, you know, so long. Um, and um, it's a big cascade of... Um, um, electrodes basically and the, uh, the switch is triggered to break down and conduct by um, uh, a laser creating a kind of channel of ionized uh, plasma. Um, so we are thinking about exactly the same design as on the Z machine, um, although ideally we'd like to not use um, SF6 uh, inside the switch, so that's kind of an interesting question. Um, uh, the, the intermediate store is charged to 5 megavolts, and the, the, the switch triggers at 5 megavolts. Um, so that's, that's lower than um, on um, the Z machine. Um, then there's 
that keeping the switch within safe operating parameters is what has led to the um, intermediate store being oversized in terms of capacitance. So we have two sets of, con well, more, at least two constraints in the, in the optimization. We're looking at the total charge transferred by the switch, and that is 67% of the Z machine. And we're also looking at the action integral, which is the integral of I squared dt. Uh, so charge transfer being integral of I dt. Um, so the action integral, we understand the damage in the switch from repeated use and operation is more proportional to the action integral. And that's 45% of um, uh, the Z machine. So keeping the switch in a safe operating condition is, is, a, is having a big influence on, our, on, our, on this design point. Um, we have a lot of these switches, so they do need to operate very reliably. Um, there is an innovation which is needed for this design to work, and that's having two switches per intermediate store. Um, so one switch per intermediate store works nicely because it's all coaxial. Two is going to require some topo topology to be done to kind of figure out how to do that. So that is something that we, a problem we have to solve, or a bit of engineering we have to solve to make this design point work. Okay, next element in the system is a bit of a mouthful: um, monolithic radial transmission line transformer. So it, monolithic radial basically means it's a gigantic disk. Uh, there's no separate elements anymore. It's one big, you know, like I don't know, uh, hubcap, <laughs> but massive. Um, so that's monolithic radial, and then it's a transmission line because it's taking the um, current from the output of the switch to uh, the center section. Um, the pulse length here is now set by the twice the transit time of the intermediate store. So this is, this is not kind of lumped circuit elements in its behavior. It's transmission lines and the speed of light matters and all this stuff. Um, and it's a transformer because there's a profile in impedance as you go along um, the transmission line. Not because the spacing changes and spacing is the same, but because the, basically the like, enclosed volume for each infinitesimal slice of transformer, uh, of transmission line, gets smaller as you get to the center uh, of the machine. So the impedance has, has a profile, and so it acts to in, uh, increase the voltage. So the output voltage, just the input voltage is 2.4, but the output voltage is 4.5 um, megavolts. Um, this has a 21 meter radial length. Um, that's important because building and supporting this is actually quite a challenge. So it could be supported with insulating structures, um, plastic materials within the water, because this is all flooded with water. Um, uh, so that's, that uh, carries certain risks. Um, at this size, at this length, um, it is maybe possible that it could be self-supporting. So it's kind of a you know, bridge structure with no, um, nothing in between, um, which could cause um, any kind of electrical breakdown or anything like that. Uh, so it's possible it could be self-supporting at uh, this size. Uh, okay, the next element as we go through um, is what's called the diode stack or the, the kind of vacuum feed-through. Um, so on the outside here we have water, on the inside we have vacuum, and we have a, a metal vacuum chamber. Um, so um, you have to transition uh, to um, plastic <coughs> and then uh, the conductors have to pass through that plastic and into the vacuum chamber. Um, the design of these things is quite involved, um, and it's not the water side which is the problem, as I understand it, it's the vacuum side. Um, so um, this, again, will be modeled after uh, similar things on um, the Z machine or um, um, uh, on the Magpie machine at Imperial. Um, this is very big. Uh, it's a five meter range. The total forward power is 145 terawatts. I really should have looked up the forward power on Z machine, is it like 60 terawatts, something like that? I think, and then I think the Sandia next generation machine, they're talking about 600 terawatts. So this is kind of more powerful, not quite as powerful as Sandia's proposed next machine. Next element, we're almost there. <laughs> next element uh, is the magnetically insulated transmission line. So this is in vacuum now, and the current densities are really starting to go up. Um, so um, there's a magnetic insulation uh, effect in here. Um, and that takes the current from the stack into the load. Um, I'm flagging the inductance here, because it's, our, our modeling is showing that the inductance of this stack and um, mitel is uh, 4 nanohenries. That's very low. Um, and that, this is why the stack radius has been pushed out to such a large value. And that's because you have the large spacings at high radius, which means they contribute less inductance. So as the, as the plates kind of come through the plastic insulator, they very quickly shrink down to a much closer spacing. 
uh, and then they proceed into the, into the load in the center. In the middle, we have three hot plates coming in here, three layers in the system. They all have to be joined together into one hot plate um, to be taken to the load. Um, so this is done with what's called a post-hole convolute. Um, so there's no way around the topology here. You have to have some holes going through ground planes carrying hot, you know, with the high voltage on. Um, so this is done on the Z machine, which is a two-layer system, uh, and it's uh, called a double post-hole convolute, and here it's called a triple post-hole convolute. We are relying on designs from Sandia here, really. Um, so there has been a lot of thinking about, uh, about that sort of um, uh, thing. But um, uh, understanding all of the um, kind of kinetic processes that take place there, which can lead to parasitic current flows through you know, lots of different mechanisms, is a, a challenging thing to do. Um, the Michael is probably also setting the weight that the crane above this thing needs to lift, because it is rather large, so possibly 100 tons, possibly more. OK, and then we are at the load. So the uh, optimized design point here is um, a 16 by 16 millimeter flyer, so length and width, 16 millimeters, two and a half millimeters thick. And this machine, when it discharges into that flyer, should accelerate it to 70 kilometers per second, and that flyer will be carrying 4.3 megajoules of kinetic energy. Uh, the peak current delivered is 48 megaramps, and the peak back EMF is 2.7 megavolts. That's quite an important number, because the voltages we're talking about here are actually quite a bit lower than other people for machines of this scale are talking about, uh, typically talking sort of 10 megavolts or more. Um, Ultimately, that's because they're doing a different load. Uh, the flyer plate load just doesn't have that bigger back EMF because it's a very low inductance load. Um, so that's having a strong influence on the rest of the machine design. And then, yeah, the current rise time is 420 nanoseconds. And this is something which has been a consistently part of the kind of design optimizations and explorations over the last probably sort of four or five months. Uh, we keep finding that sort of 400 nanosecond number as, as the optimum. Again, that's in contrast to, uh, say, our machine three, which is um, uh, 1.8 <laughs> microseconds, and to Z machine, which is 100 nanoseconds. So it's slightly longer pulse, although objectively 400 nanoseconds is still a tiny amount of time, obviously. <laughs> Last thing to mention, because I think it would be very much of interest for this uh, discussion, is um, diagnostics, or our diagnostics. Um, so above, not below. That is a design choice, we think. Um, there is maybe one good reason why you might put them below, and that's it, uh, it's possibly easier to um, uh, do the shielding. Um, so instead of having the, the, all these sections of the machine pointing up, you could have them all pointing down. Um, but I think we don't like the idea of having to excavate such a large basement, basically, or to build the machine on, on, on a platform on stilts. Um, and there are lots of other benefits to being much more easily accessible and being on the top. Um, so we think above, um, we want to make sure we're lifting the load region up above the plane of the machine so that we actually have a zero degree long line of sight um, access into the machine um, uh, from, from all around. Um, again, this is something that um, uh, is a challenge on the Z machine. Uh, the um, zero degree access line there is uh, something like a foot below the surface of the water, which makes it a bit of a challenge. Um, and then in terms of diagnostics, um, kind of first diagnostic suite, there will be many electrical diagnostics, of course, so B dots and V dots. Uh, we've very productively used um, fiber-based Faraday rotation on machine three to measure currents, and I expect that we will be doing that again uh, on this uh, system. Um, and then there'll be a large suite of optical diagnostics, so a lot of our amplifier ver verification um, validation work uh, uses optical um, imaging and self-emission diagnostics. We also want to be able to do visor to measure velocities and so on. Um, then neutron diagnostics, many, <laughs> lots. And something I do want to mention here is with a very large dynamic range, that doesn't mean an individual diagnostic necessarily with a very large dynamic range, but with a suite of diagnostics that cover a very large uh, dynamic range. Um, we don't expect to be getting the highest yields when we first start, right? We expect to be getting much lower yields and have some problems and need to fix the problems. So we need diagnostics which are going to help us in that regime where it's kind of not working and to help us fix it and get it working. So we're planning for that. Um, and also X-ray self-emission diagnostics, um, lots. Um, 
So here today, there's Hugo, who's head of experimental physics, and we also have uh, John and Francisco, who are both lead scientists in uh, the experimental team, who I think would be delighted to talk more about diagnostics at great length, I'm sure. Okay, that's an overview of the machine. Um, risks, what, what do we like about this? What don't we like? I'm just putting the things we don't like, which is sort of like put it out there. So we've been through everything, all the numbers, the model spits out and colored them red, amber, green. Um, so stack radius, um, yeah, we're concerned about this. Uh, it's very big. So manufacturing it, manufacturing the metal pieces, yep, okay, transporting them, yeah. Um, also the plastic pieces that go inside the stack. Um, that might be beyond existing kind of manufacturing capability to make 10 meter diameter, a single piece of plastic. So you might have to kind of jigsaw that up in some sort of way, which would be challenging. Um, I've mentioned the mitral inductance and weight, and there's also electrical insulation to consider. So I said the stack's kind of complicated. So if we look at the electric field gradient we have in this design, that is less than the Z machine, which implies it should be safe. If we look at the total pointing flux passing through the insulator stack, then that is also less than the Z machine. That implies it should be safe. But if we look at the strength of the magnetic insulation effect, um, the electric field is the same as the radius goes out, but the, the magnetic field drops as the radius goes out. So um, this is uh, less safe uh, compared to the Z machine for magnetic insulation. So all of that basically adds up to we don't really know exactly where this is in terms of electrical safety. We need to do more work, more study. Um, very quickly touching on the other ones, number of layers concerned about for maintainability. Uh, what happens if you have a problem on the bottom layer? Um, also, a triple post hole convolute, we'd really rather not have that. We'd rather have the design from the Z machine. Um, the individual capacitors inside the Marx bank, um, at the minute the model is showing a quite high capacitance of um, 7.5 microfarads. Um, the ones on machine 3 are 2.6, so we have to, have to have some in parallel or a new capacitor design with the manufacturer or something. Um, I'm a bit concerned about the size of the intermediate store, 3.3 outer diameter meter. Um, and so how do you transport them all to site, basically? <laughs> um, uh, it's quite big, and there's quite a lot of them. Um, so a bit concerned about that. Um, intermediate store electric field. Um, so whilst the electric field is actually lower than the Z machine, the pulse length is longer, and the propensity to break down in water is proportional to both the field and the time for which that field is applied. So it's forming streamers, like the precursor lightning bolts, basically. Um, so it's 90% of the critical E field, so we need to look at that. I've talked about the switches per intermediate store. In terms of the flyer design point, I want to just highlight a tension here. So we, we, we kind of want to keep the velocity low because it's closer to what's already been proven. Um, but then we also have worked hard to add into the model um, a tilt tolerance parameter. So this is to do with random deviations from perfection and how that might impact the uh, final performance. So we have a model which basically relates through what happens with like a time difference of arrival time of a shock on the front of the amplifier. We relate that through to a time difference of arrival of the shock at the fuel capsule, uh, which basically depends on the degree of amplification which you have and so on, other things, the geometry. Um, so we could lower the impact velocity, but we'd need a more stringent tilt requirement. So we might make impact velocity green, but we'd make tilt the tolerance red. And we could relax the tilt tolerance, but then we'd need a much faster flyer. Uh, and that's basically because a faster flyer, if it has the same tilt, you know, if it's going faster, the time difference is, is less on arrival. Um, uh, so that's a bit of a tension. Um, amplifier, I'm not going to touch on too much, but efficiency of 1.3%. Um, yeah, we have designs which are that efficient, um, but we need to improve the sphericity of the implosion, so we've got to do something there. And um, fuel, um, the total pusher kinetic energy in that gold shell is 28 kilojoules in this design point. That is actually less than revolver, so this is overall a slightly smaller design than revolver. Uh, we'd kind of like to get that back up to the, the same position or, or bigger. And then overall, as a facility, um, Shielding activation is definitely a big topic and big question. We really don't want to have to build a gigantic 80 meter diameter building with two meter thick concrete walls and a big thick concrete roof. That'd be very expensive to build. So is there another shielding solution? The machine itself is very well shielded because it's filled with water and water's an excellent blocker of neutrons um, and everything else. Um, but it's above basically is the issue, right? 
Um, so how do we do that? And also activation of material. Um, for a properly igniting shot, the mitel might be really quite activated. Uh, mitels at present are made from stainless steel, so we could maybe switch to different materials like aluminium, but then a high current, high energy mitel with aluminium has not been tested and proven, so it would be activated less. So we've got some questions there. Lifting equipment, it's a very big crane, so yeah. And then um, the last one in purple is just a question. Um, and that's one which the experimental team are still kind of wrestling with and working on. Do we need some active probing of some kind? We want to have some active probing of some kind. And I should put it this way. Do we want it in the first generation of diagnostics or do we want to plan for it and do it later? Um, so, and then what sort of active probe do you want? And we're really talking about X-ray and particle probing. Uh, so do we get a long pulse laser or do we get a short pulse laser? Or do we get a supplementary second pulse power machine of some kind? How do we do all of this? That's quite a big topic, I think, at the moment for us. Okay, and then last technical slide. Um, I wanted to make a comparison to a laser driver, just to sort of rough this in, hopefully, for the laser people in the room. So we can look at what that flyer does to the target, and we can get a kind of pressure on target specification. So it delivers three terapascals um, for 95 sec um, nanosecond pulse length over 6.6 .6 millimeter radius. So we can convert that um, uh, to a kind of um, uh, required laser specification to do the same thing. So with a NIF type laser, we see 20 megajoules as the number. With a krypton fluoride eczema laser, you see 13 megajoules as the number. And I kind of wanted to put this up here because um, I, I kind of want to be clear about something, which is like there's no, there's no magic. The amplifier throws away energy, quite a lot of energy, actually. Um, so, yeah, this is a ton more energy than the NIF laser, 10 times more energy than the NIF laser. Um, so we're not trying to say that the target is better or more efficient or something like that. Um, but ultimately what matters is how many pounds you spend and does it go bang. Um, so the cheaper driver approach using a pulse power directly allows us to have more energy. Um, good, excellent. Um, opportunities for collaboration. Um, so what can M4 do? We think that basically anything that you can imagine doing on the Z machine or anything that has been done on the Z machine, you should be able to do on M4. It's very similar. It just has more energy and more current. Um, so in terms of the flyer, we've talked about that and three terapascal impact pressure. If we were to use our existing amplifier technology, which we've been using on the gun for all of this year, um, these are the sort of specs that we might be able to, to get. So um, a 10 to 1 reduction in, in um, size, uh, but we can get massively increased pressures and, um, uh, and release velocities, uh, which are, are definitely in high energy density space. Uh, 45 terapascals is um, 450 megabar, I think. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, yeah, and then other, other loads. So wire array implosions, and we're not the expert. Well, I mean, some people in the team are experts on this. I'm not an expert on this. But, um, so this could be maybe up to 10 megajoules of thermal x-rays from these sorts of implosions. Other wire array geometries producing, you know, fancy, beautiful uh, plasma objects of astrophysical significance and all that sort of good stuff. Um, and then I don't want to I don't want to sort of talk about this too much, but I also didn't want to not put it on there. Of course, we're going to be working really, really hard to actually make this a reliable, robust ignition platform. So if we succeed with that, then that platform could be available for doing fundamental science as well. Um, yet yeah, we are looking for help and collaboration in all the, all the areas here. So the, the core machine design, um, the overall facility, and the operation of that facility as well. I kind of wanted to mention that because it's really easy to get focused on just the bits of steel but how you turn the machine around and how it works well for you or us as scientists needing to do you know very precision experiments here um, all input and knowledge there is is, is you know is uh, is really very valuable um, diagnostic development I've kind of mentioned um, one thing I will say is that we're really interested or I'm really interested anyway in real state-of-the-art neutron spectrum measurements and analysis. I feel like there's a lot more that can be extracted from the neutron signal than is normally extracted from the neutron signal. And we started work in, in, that, in that kind of area, so um, we've been prototyping um, using um, uh, Bayesian inference uh, and with a neutronics model, a Monte Carlo neutronics model in the loop of the Bayesian inference. Um, and I think we've got enough kind of proof of concept to show that that probably can work and can 
can recover meaningful information like ion temperature at lower signal levels or with different detectors than you might think based on just kind of the standard way of doing it, which is kind of cool. Um, there's some big challenges around X-ray self-emission diagnostics. This thing's inside a big high Z target. So how are you going to get the X-rays out? And then what X-rays are you going to get out? And what are you going to do with them? And then active probing, I've already, I've already flagged, again, some challenges there. It's inside a high Z target. And uh, to measure what, obviously, has to be the question. So like what source to measure what? Um, and we're also very interested in collaborations on the, um, the core plasma physics. So anything which is complex multi-physics behavior, this is where the difficulties come. Uh, it's when you have a you know, strong coupling between, say, the hydro and the radiation behavior. Uh, that's where it starts to get difficult to model. And the physics of interfaces in, this broadest, in its broadest sense. So instabilities, mixing, um, also simply like what happens to what's the kinetic process of heat conduction between two very different ion species, which are perhaps mixing into each other, you know, hydro mixing, atomic level mixing. Yeah, big challenges uh, there. Um, we would like to think really widely about, about the scope of any you know, academic access program which we create. Um, and again, this is about thinking about like the biggest opportunity, the best opportunity that we could put together. Um, so this is not, in my minds, this is not just about uh, machine four. It's also about our existing machines, so Cepage uh, and M3. Um, these are smaller platforms. Uh, we intend to maintain both of them. Uh, so they op offer opportunities for training students, initial concept development. And um, Simon, who's here, has is, is, uh, very successfully, I think, uh, moving through this process, having done a, a number of campaigns on uh, Cepage, and I think we'll be working on M3 soon enough. Um, so, yeah, that's a good opportunity. Uh, the gas guns are going to still be operational. Um, so, um, and um, gas guns by themselves are interesting, but then gas guns plus our amplifier technology can potentially lift the range of what you can do with those quite substantially, which is very interesting to, to look at. Um, Nigel, uh, who is also here, um, has been doing some uh, work with us on the, on the gas guns. Um, it's quite early days, but uh, yeah, it's good. And then another thing which we'd like to sort of consider part of this is um, access to the simulation uh, tools as well. So they have to stay on site, <laughs> but you can come to site and potentially use them, right? Um, so these are, I mean, everyone has tools, right? But these are specifically validated for the actual machines that we have, uh, with lots of you know, support and everything. So um, they'll be very well suited to understanding how to use machine for uh, and the other platforms. And also you know, links with the numerical team and the target design team uh, as well um, to, to help run simulations, your own or ours or whatever, and understand things. Um, and then, yeah, last thing to sort of tee up for, for today is um, how can we structure the access? Um, so you have much more experience than we do in academic access schemes. Um, which are the best? Um, why? What can we copy from, from those? And you know, what doesn't work so well? And what, can we, what, should be, you know, what mistakes should we be avoiding making in, um, in structuring all this? And that's me. I just mentioned um, we've got a lot of people online, so we need to use the microphones for these sessions. So if Nick, you want to take a yeah. seat and use that microphone there. Do we have people handing out microphones at the back? Um, so anybody have a first question? A gentleman here. Thank you, Nick. Um, yeah, yes, you're on. Thank you. There we go. Um, Fascinating talk, thank you. Um, obviously, a, ma a major design consideration is the trade-off between current th that gives you capability and the, and the voltage and rise time that provide you with flexibility in the design. Um, for, for some of the classes of academic access, uh, loads that we're interested in, implosion velocity is key, and particularly wires, <coughs> wires the sorts of radiation sources we're, we're used to using. H have the First Light team sort of invested any calculations in, in seeing what the implications of moving to 400 nanoseconds versus one or 200 nanoseconds are for, for those types of applications? So we have, we, have, we have looked at that from the point of view of um, um, kind of fusion gain with an imploding liner, um, but only in a quite sort of, we haven't done much work basically. Um, and it does make a big difference. Um, so it might be a factor of 100 or 1,000 less fusion yield going from 400 going from 100 to 400 nanoseconds. So it does make a big difference. Um, so
something that we are, have been discussing a lot is, is it possible to build a machine which is upgradable in some sort of way? Um, so, and what's, what's kind of doable? Um, so upgrading the voltage is extremely, I mean, building a whole new machine. Um, upgrading the energy, maybe, if you were to have a, a you know, bigger radius. Um, but one idea which we are quite interested in exploring, we haven't done much work on it, but is in that space where we have our intermediate store, could you swap out for a different intermediate store and further pulse forming lines within that space to shorten the pulse length? But again, we're not really sure what that means because you'd still have the same voltage, but you'd have a shorter pulse length. So like, what is it that matters for the liner implosions? Is it voltage or is it pulse length? Or is, do you have a short pulse length because you need the voltage? And so I think this was kind of an expected discussion today. Um, and so we'd love to get some like, input on this. Um, and like I say, it is, you know, this is genuinely a chance to influence the machine design. So this is a massive debate like every day at first light. It's like long pulse, short pulse, you know, what's the compromise? Thank you. Um, other questions? A gentleman over here. Nice talk, Nick. Um, I have a comment and a question. My comment is uh, I would like to add um, gas puffs as a load uh, in your list. Uh, my question is, how quickly uh, can you replace the um, hardware? Yeah, I think the objective is going to be to engineer it so that we can do um, one shot a day or eventually, you know, when the facility is, is mature, like four shots a week, that kind of regular cadence, which is what they do achieve most of the time on, on the Z machine. So that's the objective, is to engineer it for that. It's not going to do that to start with, but it's, it's going to be difficult problems to start with, but that's, that's the objective. Um, gentlemen over here, apologies, I should have said, could you say your name and affiliation as well, please, thanks. Uh, Robbie Scott, Central Laser Facility. So in uh, laser fusion, we use a, a number of shocks and then an acceleration phase in order to uh, reach high velocity whilst not adding too much entropy to the fuel, i.e., for those that aren't that familiar, not heating the fuel up too much to keep it compressible. So if you've only got a single impact, how do you achieve that, that same sort of low entropy in your implosion? Yeah, so, so the, the revolver design doesn't actually use that. Um, it does on the outside, on the outer shell, but the, the final conditions delivered to the gold shell, it's just being smacked once, basically, like one strong shock and then, and then imploding inwards. Um, and because it's not an, an isobaric hotspot design with a nice layer and so on, the kind of concept of ADAR-BAT and isentropic parameter and things isn't really meaningful because the whole fuel has to get to the required temperature at the end. And it's a balance between the first shock and then the isotropic compression from there. Um, if you're asking about, you know, for the far future for a power plant and getting to high gain, um, well, actually, it is possible to separate a shock in an amplifier and get more than one shock out. Um, it's a lot harder. <laughs> Um, so that is actually one of the reasons why we're focusing on the revolver design for the ignition demonstrator. Um, but it is possible to do the other thing. Um, also, isobaric hotspot is not the only way to get to high gain, in, in our view. Um, so, yes, that would be very challenging. It is possible, but it's a lot more challenging. And so that's, we're trying to avoid having to do that for this next thing. Thank you. Uh, just one other comment, if that's all right. Have you, I th it might be worthwhile thinking about TIM-based diagnostics because that would then be compatible with other facilities so you could swap them out. And yes. Hugo, do you want to say something about that? Uh, yes, absolutely. We're considering it. We visited Sandia. Sorry, we visited Sandia the other week and we realised that the environment is much more challenging than NIF. Uh, so we'd love to do something online for TIMs because they can put out practicality on them. Absolutely. Any way we can make diagnostics interchangeable, while I've got the microphone, I've got two questions from okay. Zoom. Please I'm go ahead, yep. Yeah. Uh, so we have one from David Phillips of L3 Harris. Uh, if the rise time is 420 nanoseconds, what is the full width half max of the pulse wanted at the load? Um, pass. <laughs> uh, it's, that's, that's zero to 100 percent rise time, so that start to, to peak. And then I, the reason I say pass is because the frequency is changing quite a lot, because the inductance is changing quite a lot, so it rolls over quite rapidly and sort of there's a long tail. So, I, I, yeah, sorry. He seems happy. Uh, 
Alistair Moore, I think from Livermore, uh, what margin is built into the design to achieve fuel gain and ignition with the limited energy available? Yeah, well, I can answer by proxy and say that we're trying to match the revolver design. So it's, it's the margin of the revolver design. Um, I can try and sort of give more detail um, and, and say that um, actually all the designs that we're finding are not actually anywhere near fuel gain of 100. They're much more like fuel gain of 500 or 600. Um, and that's because we have so many kind of guardrails in the optimization that it's just not letting us go to, to, low, to low, lower yield designs. Um, so we're, we're trying to kind of account for as much as we can. Um, we're trying to keep the implosion velocity you know, high-ish. We're trying to make sure the ignition temperature is high-ish. So um, mix is a big concern. So we do have, we have started to go beyond the revolver design in terms of what's in their, their original papers in terms of mixed models and trying to add those into the code. Um, we're, we're building um, a kind of new reduced order implosion model. Um, which we call flame, uh, which is trying to actually really capture all of the implosion physics um, in, in much better detail. So we have that, we're kind of trying to stick very close to revolver. Good answer. Thank you. Um, there's a question at the back. Uh, hello, Nick. Um, Alex Robinson from Central Ace Facility here. Sorry, I, I, apologies, I came in a bit late, but so you may have said this, but uh, is all the funding in place for this? And if so, when do you expect, what's the timeline for M4's construction and completion? So we're, we're aiming to have it operational by 2027. Um, and um, yeah, in terms of, in terms of funding, um, we, we are in a good position right now. We can move forward with the project with things like the building and stuff like that. Uh, we don't have the full funding yet. Um, we're speaking to investors, you know, a lot right now. <laughs> um, I will say one more thing, which is because um, you know we really are genuinely moving forward forward with this. Uh, so I hope it's not a surprise to Ian, but we're hoping to sign ahead of terms with UK AA, uh, hopefully in the next few days, hopefully very soon, um, to locate this at the um, Cullum uh, site where there is there is a plot big enough for it. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Uh, other questions? I, oh, the one at the back on the left. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk, Danny Russell, Imperial College. Um, I'm, I'm interested to know if you were to do, like, once the machine is completed, if you were to do, like, lab astro type experiments, how many shots would you envisage an external user having in a campaign, and how much would it cost the external user? Yes. <laughs> Um, very good questions. So I, I think Z machine does something like 140, 150 shots a year. So that that's the kind of ambitious total sort of shot budget per year. Um, and I, I think we've been thinking sort of 10 or 20 percent of the shots could be for academic access. So it won't be a huge amount. It's not a you know 10 hertz laser facility. Um, but you know if we're going to do it. We should do it properly. Um, the way we do academic access so far is we fund the sort of normal running costs of the machine and um, staff costs for you know, helping collaborate with people. Um, but the academics have provided their own shot hardware, uh, typically made in their own workshops and so on. Um, uh, I, I, so that's, that's how we've done it so far. Um, but yeah, that, that would all need working out. Sure, thanks. Thank you. And perhaps in the remaining minute, if I could ask you a question sort of engineering complex optimization problem. Um, could you have given that talk when you left Oxford? And do you have access to the sorts of skills you need to build these machines? It's a sort of skills policy question, I guess. Um, I, I could definitely not have built that, built that when, I left, when I left Oxford. Um, I don't think we as a team could have built it six months ago. Um, so I, I think, yeah, the, the, the the, the key things which have enabled us to do the optimization and get to that design point are it's, it's all of the, it's how to model the components of the machine in that, in that sort of simplest but not too simple form. Um, so that, there's the model itself. Then there's, there's a second layer which is the constraints on the model which are actually as valuable as the model itself. Um, and you get, you get people talking about this in a lot of kind of machine learning and AI sort of literature or you know, current discourse. Um, how, how do you prevent the model from getting obviously you know, incorrect answers which violate some sort of physics principle or something? Um, and then 
the kind of optimization approach which we're building on top of that is the kind of absolute best in class sort of machine learning um, optimization methods. But again, with they have, they have to be run in the right way to like respect the physics of the problem and respect engineering constraints. What 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 we've learned is is that if you take machine learning approaches to this kind of very hard, complicated physics problem, it, it, they basically learn how to cheat. You know, if you if you run the simulation tools with machine learning optimization algorithms, uh, they invariably optimize to find bugs. They find the one stupid case which makes one cell in the simulation go to a billion degrees, and then you get loads of fusion yield. And it's complete nonsense. So it's, it's always that skill on top. So I suppose if I, you know, coming to the skills part, you have to understand simulations. You have to understand the optimization methods, how they work, what they exploit, and how they do that. But then it's putting that together with the kind of physics and engineering judgment is what's actually allowing us to make progress. I don't know if I'm answering your question. So is, yeah. is, is, would there be a risk bit, or the last bit on your risk chart that says um, things we haven't discovered yet that the machine learning has tripped us up on? Uh, well, yes, they, they, they're, we're always looking for the unknown unknown. Right. Um, final question from me, if I may. Um, so the, your, your first slide, um, design not fixed, but presumably it's getting more and more fixed as you go through the, uh, the, the design iterations. Do you have like a, and it strikes me then that does your academic access program need to start now? Um, and do you have like a, a roadmap of the sorts of problems you're, you're, access, you're, you're amenable to discussing now? And um, uh, presumably the last ones on the table will be uh, the diagnostics. Um, I, I think there's, it's probably fair to say there's more time to figure out the diagnostics. I think that's probably right. true. Um, and I think that's why we're having this meeting now, is because right, we right. want that input. Um, and it, so, yes. yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. Um, that's a really fascinating talk. Thank you.